When we last examined the maturing individual, the ego was in a state of psychic participation with the maternal Ouroboros. In this state, the child does not experience himself as something distinct from the world. There is no sense of an I, but the child is instead absorbed in the realm of the maternal instincts. The question then becomes, how does the ego erupt from this situation? As we saw in the last episode, the ego naturally strives to rid itself of the dominating will of the mother by producing a negative perception of her. This can hypothetically allow the ego to achieve more independence. Before this, we can say that a person exists in a state of mystical participation, going through life without identifying himself as an individual apart from his society. The embedding of the germinal ego in the unconscious corresponds sociologically to the state in which collective ideas prevailed, and the group and group consciousness were dominant. In this state, the ego was not an autonomous, individualized entity with a knowledge, morality, volition, and activity of its own. It functioned solely as part of the group, and the group, with its superordinate power, was the only real subject. This perfect paradise is without conflict, because a person lacks awareness of the true nature of the world. Correspondingly, mythologies depict the primordial universe as a place of unity, where opposites have not yet arrived to conflict with the laziness of childhood and the passivity which accompanies the mother archetype and unconscious participation. The desire to be independent from one's mother is the first time the ego begins to be felt as something separate and a sense of I-ness emerges. But often, a more powerful force will act to shape the ego in order to divide consciousness from the unconscious. This is usually the dominating will of the rules and norms of a society operating through the principle of dominance, or in other words, the father archetype. Human societies impose standards of behavior on children, which causes a sundering in the psyche. They can no longer simply live according to their instinctual nature, but now must follow the rules imposed by authority figures. One's father often plays this role, although there may be multiple forces which impose such standards upon the child. The child absorbs these standards of behavior and begins to impose them upon himself, becoming an ego who imposes order upon the instincts. The function of the chief, which is to will and decide, becomes the model for all subsequent acts of free will in the ego of the individual, and the lawmaking function originally attributed to God and later to the mana personality has in modern man become his inner court of conscience. The ego, since it is the ordering principle of the psyche, is the masculine aspect, and this is true even in women, whose ego is fundamentally masculine. This masculine ego, which organizes the psyche and attempts to subdue all activity to its will in accordance to social expectations, controls the instincts which arise from the unconscious, which is generally characterized as feminine and associated with nature. This separation of the ego from the unconscious is symbolically expressed as the separation of the masculine and feminine world parents, an idea, as we will see soon, which is extremely common in creation stories. The state of separation of the world parents, which initiates the independence of the ego and consciousness by giving rise to the principle of opposites, is therefore also the stage of increasing masculinity. Ego consciousness stands in manly opposition to the feminine unconscious. This strengthening of consciousness is borne out by the laying down of taboos and moral attitudes, which delimit the conscious from the unconscious by substituting knowing action for unwitting impulse. Prior to the separation of the masculine ego from the feminine unconscious, these two spheres are more or less mixed together without differentiation, but over time, the ego splits off and separates from the unconscious as its own psychic entity. The unconscious is also associated with chaos because of its uncertainty and lack of control. The ego, by contrast, is associated with order since it is able to order the body and subdue the instincts. It is consistent with the conscious-unconscious structure of the opposites that the unconscious should be regarded as predominantly feminine and consciousness as predominantly masculine. This correlation is self-evident, because the unconscious, alike in its capacity to bring to birth and to destroy through absorption, has feminine affinities. The feminine is conceived mythologically, 
under the aspect of this archetype. Ouroboros and Great Mother are both feminine dominants, and all psychic constellations over which they rule are under the dominance of the unconscious. Conversely, its opposite, the system of ego consciousness, is masculine. With it are associated the qualities of volition, decision, and activity, as contrasted with the determinism and blind drives of the pre-conscious egoist state. This is why the ego is said to emerge from the original maternal Ouroboric situation, and once it does, it encounters a world of adversity. Where once everything was a perfect paradise, where little effort was needed, now the world is seen as a place to be feared, with chaos potentially lurking around every corner. Thus consciousness brings with it a level of understanding which makes it difficult to cope with the world. It is also when the rules imposed by authority figures collide with the natural instincts, creating a source of tension and discontent in the psyche. The breakdown of the Ouroboric initial state leads to differentiation and duality, decombination of the original ambivalence, division of the hermaphroditic constitution, and the splitting of the world into subject and object, inside and outside, and to the creation of good and evil, which are only discriminated with the expulsion from the Ouroboric Garden of Paradise, where the opposites lie down together. Naturally enough, as soon as man becomes conscious and acquires an ego, he feels himself a divided being, since he also possesses a formidable other side which resists the process of becoming conscious. Naturally enough, as soon as a man becomes conscious and acquires an ego, he feels himself a divided being since he also possesses a formidable other side which resists the process of becoming conscious. This ego consciousness, though it brings a certain level of suffering, organizes the psyche, first subduing the instincts of the body in accordance with the conscious goal. Man's will to dominate nature is but an extension and projection of that fundamental experience of the ego's potential power over the body, discovered in the voluntariness of muscular movement. Before this, the body acted according to instinctual archetypes and were not controlled by the ego, as Neumann writes about the pre-ego phase. Containment in the Ouroboros and its supremacy over the ego mean on a bodily level that ego and consciousness are at the outset continually at the mercy of the instincts, impulses, sensations, and reactions deriving from the world of the body. Consciousness is able to control these instinctual impulses to some extent. The birth of the ego brings about several important psychological changes. The first is narcissism, where the ego believes that it is the center of the world and thinks of itself in a high regard. Despite narcissism often being thought of as a negative trait, it is important for the ego to put itself in a place of supreme importance for survival reasons. Narcissism is a necessary transitional phase during the consolidation of the ego. The emancipation of ego consciousness from thraldom to the unconscious leads, like all emancipation, to an exaggeration of one's own position and importance. Another development is what Neumann calls Weltschmerz, a German word which literally means world pain, and it is the state of understanding the imperfection in the world, as well as the feeling of internal conflict which arises from the birth of the ego, similar to how Adam and Eve experienced the world after being expelled from the Garden of Eden. The process of ego formation is seen in the symbols of many creation stories as the separation of opposites. Just as the masculine consciousness splits from the female unconsciousness, so do the world parents from each other. This is usually represented as the separation of heaven and earth. As the anthropologist James Fraser wrote, it is a common belief of primitive people that sky and earth were originally joined together. The sky either lying flat on the earth or being raised so little above it that there was no room between them for people to walk upright. Where such beliefs prevail, the present elevation of the sky above the earth is often ascribed to the might of some god or hero who gave the firmament such a shove that it shot up and has remained up above ever since. We see one example of this in an Egyptian creation story, which shows the earth god Geb and the sky goddess Nut being separated from one another. Note how the sky is a female goddess and the earth is a male deity, though in most cases it is the other way around, as consciousness is associated with the climb upwards. This idea is also seen in Greek mythology. 
Before the creation of the world, according to Hesiod's Theogony, everything was a primordial chaos. Out of this chaos emerged Gaia, goddess of the earth, who contained the sky god Uranus within her, and separating herself from him. A similar theme appears in the Upanishads. In the beginning, this world was non-being. This being became being. It turned into an egg. It burst asunder. One part of the eggshell was silver, the other part was of gold. The silver part is the earth, the golden part is the sky. Here, the separation of opposites does not involve feminine and masculine, showing that different cultures include different metaphors to demonstrate the character of ego consciousness. In one Chinese creation story, heaven and earth were in chaos like a chicken's egg, and Pan Ku, a Chinese creation deity, was born in the middle of it. In 18,000 years, heaven and earth opened and unfolded. The limpid that was yang became the heavens, the turbid that was yin became the earth. Pan Ku lived within them, and in one day he went through 9,000 transformations, becoming more divine than heaven and wiser than earth. Each day the heavens rose 10 feet higher, each day the earth grew 10 feet thicker, and each day Pan Ku grew 10 feet taller. The division between these two realms is also frequently the division between light and darkness. As a Maori myth puts it, Rangi and Papa, the heaven and the earth, were regarded as the source from which all things, gods and men, originated. There was darkness, for these two still clung together, not yet having been rent apart. And the children begotten by them were ever thinking what the difference between darkness and light might be. They knew that beings had multiplied and increased, and yet light had never broken upon them, but ever darkness continued. Take a Taoist myth as another example. Before the great plainness came to be, there was a dark limpidity and a mysterious quiescence, dim and dark. No image of it can be formed. Its midst was void, its exterior was non-existence. Things remained thus far for long ages. This is called obscurity. Heaven formed on the outside, and earth became fixed within. Heaven took its body from the yang, so it was round and in motion. Earth took its body from the yin, so it was flat and question. The coming of light is a universal idea in mythology, and metaphorically represents the coming of consciousness. This light, the symbol of consciousness and illumination, is the prime object of the cosmogonies of all people. Just as light illuminates darkness, so consciousness illuminates the unknown, and so light is how early people understand the nature of consciousness. The idea of opposites, of polarity, as seen in myths as the opposite of light and dark, chaos and order, known and unknown, or masculine and feminine, is one of the fundamental traits of consciousness, as it allows us to discriminate the world and to categorize it according to general ideas. Through opposites, we can project our mental ideas about the known upon the unknown. Only in the light of consciousness can man know, and this act of cognition, of conscious discrimination, sunders the world into opposites, for experience of the world is only possible through opposites. This is why the separation of unified opposites is so common in creation stories, as it represents how a conscious person experiences the world, that is, through opposites. The separation of heaven and earth from each other is also the creation of space. As discussed in my bicameral mind videos, the idea of space gives rise to many of the features of consciousness, particularly a mind space. Thus, this myth also gives birth to one of the fundamental metaphorical notions needed for consciousness. Originally, there were no abstract spatial components. They all possessed a magical reference to the body, had a mythical, emotional character, and were associated with gods, colors, meanings, illusions. Gradually, with the growth of consciousness, Things and places were organized into an abstract system and differentiated from one another. But originally, thing and place belonged together in a continuum and were fluidly related to an ever-changing ego. In this inchoate state, there was no distinction between I and you, inside and outside, or between men and things, just as there was no clear dividing line between man and the animals, man and man, man and the world. Everything participated in everything else. 
lived in the same undividing and overlapping state in the world of the unconscious, as in the world of dreams. This understanding of spatial components also gives rise to an understanding of time, which is a spatialized time. Not only space, but time and the passage of time are oriented by the mythical space picture. Many features of creation stories are the result of the birth of consciousness, and creation stories themselves arise from people who have become conscious of their existence, and thus seek explanations for their own existence. The creation stories that result are not scientific accounts of the origins of the universe, but they do reveal how consciousness arises from a psychological perspective. The birth of consciousness, however, is not the end of psychological development, as the ego must now contend with a hostile world which attempts to subordinate it. This struggle against the world gives rise to a new type of myth, the hero's journey. The story of the hero, as set forth in the myths, is the history of this self-emancipation of the ego, struggling to free itself from the power of the unconscious and to hold its own against overwhelming odds. In part 5, we will examine the hero story as it pertains to the psychological development of the individual.